everybody and welcome back to the search with Lisa. I am so excited to start this episode, but not only the episode, this season. If you are new, I want to welcome you again. My name is Lisa and I cover unsolved cases, including mostly missing and murder cases. We will be expanding a little bit this season, but we'll get into that later. If you are new, please make sure to hit that subscribe button, follow, and turn the notifications on. That way you don't miss when we upload every Thursday at 8 p.m. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is our season two. Season one went by so fast. I am glad to see everybody back. I hope everybody's new year started out good. Mine has for the most part. We're not too far in it, but it has. And I hope if you were off for a while or, you know, celebrated the holidays that everything went as planned. If not, I hope at least whatever is going on that you are getting rest and the peace of mind that you need. So everybody, welcome back to season two. You will see some changes throughout the season that I hope that you enjoy. As we continue on, we try to level up as much as we can and make it as valuable as possible. Anyways, guys, let's get into it today. We are going to be talking about an older case. Now, just like in other episodes, you have seen the why there's different reasons why I choose cases. And I think today, as you listen, you will see why I chose this case. As you know, with the search, one thing that I very much value is bringing awareness to certain issues so that also we can possibly learn something, get something to maybe prepare us to not be in a position. You know, it's never the victim's fault. But as we listen, sometimes maybe we can just pick up red flags on somebody or something. So I hope that you're returning because you are enjoying the way that being told. Again, leave comments down. If there's anything that I can help you with, leave them below and I will make sure to get you the best answers possible. So like I said, we're going to get into it. It is an older case. It is on Lorene Ron. That is spelled L-A-U-R-E-E-N, Lorene. Ron is R-A-H-N. She was born April 3rd, 1966 in Manchester, New Hampshire. Now, before I get too far into it, I always tell people I always love to give a background on the person, a little bit of who they were. It doesn't matter how old the case was, but it lets you know who they are, what they strive to be, you know, and if maybe something can stand out if we are looking for them, right? So anyway, but I also feel that it helps you relate to them just a little bit. And if I can do that, then if you are relating, you may just take that extra glance to help. So a little bit more about Maureen. Her parents divorced when she was an infant. So she primarily was brought up with her mother, Judith. When Lorene was four, she and Judith moved to Miami, Florida. But six years later, they returned to Manchester. By 1980, they resided in the third floor of an apartment in Merrimack Street. At this time, like I said, she was about 14 years old that we're going to talk about. So at this time, Lorene was a student at Parkside Junior High. She was described as happy, outgoing. She was a good student. She got along with her mother. She loved to sing and dance, and she dreamed of being like an actress. However, though, Lorene did kind of dabble in a little bit of trouble. So I would feel if she had this personality of wanting to be extra, you know, an actress, very just out like dancing and just really over the edge, I would picture a little dramatic, of course, being an actress. She probably fantasized a lot and, you know, wanted to go out to possibly Hollywood or, you know, these were maybe some of her thoughts and stuff. So... As she's getting older, I'm sure she's like, no, I'm ready for 
the big times. Like, I want to do fun things. And that kind of got her in a little bit of trouble. She spent a lot of time, though, they said, on the streets, talked about running away. Like, I'm sure, like, I'm running away to Hollywood. And began smoking pot and drank alcohol. And when I say they, I'm talking about her mom and people uh, that knew her around the time. She wasn't like an alcoholic all the time, but she was dabbling. So I think a lot of teenagers tend to kind of get out and do things like that, especially around the 14, 15, they start just wanting to experiment. Even back in the 80s, they were out doing things. And back then, drinking was at the age, I believe, 18. Now, you know, it's 21, so 18. So even if you... Go back then, if you're talking 14, 15, you know, they're thinking, oh, in a couple years, it's legal anyway. Anyway, bottom line is, she was starting to get a little antsy to get out and do her thing. She was kind of pushing it. But, like I said, same time, she did good in school. Just curious, like a lot of teenagers. But she did talk about running away. And I think that her goal was she wanted to run away and be a star. Like, that's what teenagers a lot were doing in the 70s and 80s that wanted to get into acting. Like, they were taken off going to California. I mean, she was a long way, though. She was in Massachusetts and New Hampshire areas. She had a long way to go from there. I'm going to take you to the time now up to when things started to happen. We are now on April 26, 1980. So like I told you, she is 14 years old. She was left to stay at home at the apartment. Now her mother, Judith, was spending the evening attending an out-of-town tennis match. From the information I gathered, I don't have the name, but I believe that the mom was dating like a tennis pro. So they would travel together and go out to do his matches. A lot of times, Lorene would go with them and travel with them. I mean, it was kind of an exciting thing. It wasn't just your average match. This time, Lorene did not want to go. I believe Judith kind of was like not wanting, you know, it's so weird when moms have those intuitions like, oh, I'm not really excited about leaving you here. But okay, she ended up leaving her at home. She was on spring break, which was a key time, which I think is why it was like kind of a different time, why she wanted to like stay at home. They were hanging out, talking phones. You know, there wasn't like a schedule for school, things like that. Lorene spent the day around the neighborhood and at the convenience store on the block. Now, I guess that was the thing to do, to go up there, get stuff. That's where she was at during the day. Uh, several family members had stopped by. The family member had stopped by the apartment during the day. So in the evening, because like I said, the mom was gone all day. So the aunt I know was around. There was other people. So they stopped by, you know, to see her. In the evening, she invited one male and one female. Now, like I said, going into this story, far as information, I got things from Charlie's Project, some stuff from Wikipedia, some news articles, things, but a lot of names are not mentioned, and that's unfortunate because I wanted to find more information. Even trying to listen to some other people that covered, I found that they were struggling with the names too. So I think as a collective, we all were a little frustrated about this, but we all take something different, and that's what's great. So when you hear me say male and female, that is why because we don't have names. I will say though, that she says she had a male and a female come over. Rumors were that there was actually a fourth person, that's just allegedly, but we know solid there was a male and a female that came over. They came over, the three of them drank a six pack and I believe a bottle of wine is what the female friend had said. I think they talked about wine coolers too. Lorene's friends would say later that they'd seen her restocking wine coolers at the convenience store during the day. So it was possibly like an exchange for alcohol so i guess that's like she remember they said she went up there at, on the side so she of course she was only 14 she could not buy she might have done like some extra work up there helped them and that's how she got the alcohol never really was said how she got it now the male that came over 
I'm thinking was at least 18. We'll get into that later. Could have been the one that brought it. So these are all kind of allegedly a little bit of speculations of what we have gathered as the story goes on. Around 12.30 a.m. on April 27th, Maureen was sitting with her male friend in the living room when they heard voices in the apartment building hallways. He was exited the apartment through the back door, assuming that that was Lorene's mom coming home. He didn't want to get Lorene in trouble. So, you know, it's like you hear mom's coming home. He's out the back. The male friend stated that he heard Lorene lock the door behind him when he left. So it's kind of like, all right, it's an apartment building. You can go in one way or you can go out the back. You can get out the back way so you don't have to go through everything. And that's where he went out the back door. So I just kind of want to give you a vision of that. You're getting your friend out. I know I've done it. You're getting your friend out, getting things cleared. The female friend of course, was still there. Another neighbor confirmed having heard voices approaching the apartment around the same time. Sometime around 1.15 a.m. on April 27th, so see, this was the 26th, we're just kind of going over midnight, all right, into the 27th. Judith, the mom, arrives home with her boyfriend from the match and noticed that the light bulbs on the three of the apartment building floors had been unscrewed. Weird, right? Leaving the hallways completely dark. When she arrived at her apartment front door, she found it unlocked. Now, Judy initially looked into her daughter's room, darkened bedroom, and saw the bed was occupied and assumed it was Lauren. Her boyfriend then noticed that the back door was open. Now remember, the male friend said when he left, he remembered her locking the door. He remembered hearing it. I would assume that's what she would do too, wouldn't you? I would assume that, you know, you're getting your friend out. Obviously, you don't want mama to know you're hearing things because you think mama's getting ready to come in. You're going to lock the door, play things off. I really think that's, that that part is definitely true. Her boyfriend noticed the back door was unlocked. Judith went into Lauren's room to ask her why but realized as she approached, the person that was in the bed was not her daughter, but yet the friend. Lorene's friend claimed that Lorene had been in bed with her and then had taken a pillow and blanket to sleep on the couch in the living room. The girl would later state that she was unable to recall any of the like night due to like her like she had drank too much she says she was inebriated upon further examination of the apartment judith found Lorene's purse and her brand new sneakers for her birthday gift in the living room none of Lorene's possessions including her money clothing were missing nothing was missing nor were there signs of a struggle in the apartment so this is odd. Her new sneakers, money. Why is she not there? If she was going somewhere, why didn't she take her money? You know, and does the friend know something? I don't know. Judith called family member to see if Lauren had been like there. Had you seen her? She said her and her boyfriend went out, searched the neighborhood. Around 3.45 a.m., Judith spotted actually a police car. She flagged him down to report her daughter missing. For several weeks, police believe that Lorene had run away. Now remember, she was kind of pulling these kind of stunts, but it doesn't matter. She was 14 years old, so we don't care what you think. The She's 14, whether she's ran away or not. But I think also they were saying, like they were trying to look at this as positive as possible. Like, okay, she's ran away. Let's just check in. We'll find her. So I get that part. After them kind of checking in with people, when she did not return, they began to kind of modify that theory. They instead believed that she had left the apartment intending to come back and something had happened. A bus company employee told police that he had sold a ticket to a girl matching Lorene's description the day of her disappearing. So it's like, okay, maybe we're on to something. 
and a driver from the company identified Loreen from an old photograph as a girl he dropped off in Park Square in Boston. Well, weeks later, police obtained more recent like photographs and interviewed him again. Well, the driver said no longer was he sure that that was the girl that he dropped off. So it's like backwards. Now you're not sure. Sometimes you wonder, do are people scared to get involved? Are people, like, did he have time to think about it? Was like, oh, I'm just going to be like, no, I didn't see. You know, you just don't know sometimes. How did you know two weeks ago? Pictures change, though, angles. I know. I know I have better angles. We all have better angles. But, no, you know, versus a profile, face on, hair color, up, down, all that can change. So I get it how some people can resemble and then don't. But it was very unfortunate on that because they kind of thought they were a little on to something. Six weeks after Lorene disappeared, Denise Denault, a 25-year-old woman who lived two blocks from Lorene residence, went missing, okay? So from a bar in Manchester. So she was a little older. Now, I will fill you in. Decades later, police did determine that the suspect serial killer Terry Peter Rosamusen was living in an area under Bob Evans. That's what he went by, but, it, you know, his name was Terry Peter Rosamusen. I think I'm pronouncing the name right. Anyway, later pleaded guilty to murdering his wife in California in 2003 and died in 2010. Authorities believe that he may have been involved in many of six murders and disappearances, including Denise, who vanished in 81 and was never found. Now, the one thing I want to say is, the reason I brought that up is when they were doing some searches and looking around, there was some people that went missing prior to her and after her. The one that I just mentioned when I talked about Denise, she favored Maureen. She was close to in proximity. That is why I wanted to kind of bring that in. That was some information that we were able to get out of that looking. As of now, there is no connection with him being involved in the disappearance. So I want to kind of talk about as time's going on. On October 1st, 1980, so we're just talking a few months later, Judith, the mom, found that she had been charged for three phone calls placed in California. She did not have friends or relatives there. So that's weird. It's like, who would charge? Now, remember back then, you could use like calling cards. You could do things, charge at your phone. Things were much different. We're talking 1980, okay? That brings back memories of ways that you could like make calls and charge it. People accept it, three ways, all that stuff. No cell phones. So for anybody younger watching, you could do things like that. So that's why she's saying she had been charged for three phone calls to California that she did not have any friends out there, any relatives. Now, remember, Lorene, that was her dreams. That's what she wanted to do. She wanted to go out to California. She wanted to be an actress. So, she, you know, first thing that's popping in her head, but not having any ties out there was even a little more scary to think that maybe Lorene was out there. But if so... All right, maybe that's where the calls were going. Two calls were placed from a motel in Santa Monica. And the, another one was from a motel in Santa Ana. The later of which we made to Teen Sexual Assistance Hotline. That's what the phone lines were. Now this gets a little tricky. So remember now, when they made a connection to where the phone lines were going to, what the phone calls were to make it. It was a sexual assistance hotline. Now, you wonder, like, what does that mean? What is a sexual assistance? We think automatically, like, maybe was it, like, 900 numbers, stuff like that? No. It claimed that it was for sex help education, people that were struggling with their identity, places they could go, of that type of nature. Detectives spoke with the physician who maintained the hotline. He initially denied having known anything of the call. 
So we're going to say Dr. Z did not know anything about her calling. Five years later, in 1985, Carol Jensen, an investigator from the organization of Wings for Children, called the physician and he changed his story. He claimed that numerous young women and runaways occasionally visited his wife in their home and that one of the girls may have been Lorene. He also stated that Annie Sprinkle, a sex educator and former pornographic actress who allegedly knew his wife, might have had information regarding Lorene's disappearance and those of other runaway girls. However, both investigators from Wings for Children and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were unable to find any evidence linking Sprinkles to Lorene's disappearance. With that little information, what I'm hearing, and I'm just allegedly, hypothetically, what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking a phone line a physician and his wife helps, you know, runaways. You know, there's pornographic actress that is in this area. They're going to the wife. This isn't all adding up. There's a lot of runaways that go out to these areas looking to make it big. The next thing you know, they are stuck in trafficking situations. And these are red flags that are going off to me. I'm like, something's not right with all of this. My gut is telling me that, but this is all allegedly, okay? But something's not all right with this. And I'm sure Judith is thinking the same thing. Don't quote me on it, but I'm guaranteeing she's like, mm -mm, something's not right. Throughout 1981, Judith claimed to have received numerous mysterious phone calls from an unknown individual, which she always received. Now listen at approximately 3.45. During these calls, Judith claimed that the caller never spoke. This is over a year later, 1981. The phone calls continued for several years after Lorene's disappearance increasing in frequency during Christmas holidays. The calls eventually stopped. After she changed her phone number, which I'm actually kind of surprised. Like, I don't know if I was getting those calls, just me. I don't know why. Because Judith is very, very into searching. So I don't know exactly what their reason was for changing the number. I don't know if she was thinking, is this real? At the time, she was thinking this could be her. So I'm not sure why she changed it. Because it seems like if you were getting these calls, why would you? So it may have been a period gone by and then maybe she, you know, moved, whatever, and or something happened, she had to change them. I, I don't know exactly why. Janet Roy, though, also reported on several occasions after Lorene's disappearance that a young girl called the Roy's family's telephone asking to speak to Roy's son. Whenever Michael picked up the phone, the caller was silent. Roy believes that as she would refer to Michael as Mike, a nickname only Loreen used to use for her cousin. So, I don't know. Was she calling? And we're going to get into all that. I just want to give you everything that went on and then we're going to kind of talk about what we think is going on. Anyway, Detective Jensen visits California in 1986. She located the motels from which the October 1980 phone calls had been placed. So this is six years later. She discovered that one of the motels may have been used for filming locations by a child pornographer known as Dr. Z. Okay. However, Jensen was unable to link Dr. Z to the hotline. So, earlier I had said Dr. Z, but I was just like, 
kind of being, you know, a little facetious. He was a physician. I don't know the physician's name. So I'm just saying Dr. Z. Now you know why I say Dr. Z. But again, we have to hold this allegedly. The same year, a childhood friend of Lorraine's named Roger received a phone call from a woman who claimed to be Lori. The mother answered the phone, called, and stated that the woman claimed to have been her son's former girlfriend. Roger had dated Laureen when they were like 12, I think. Yeah, they were both like around 12. So it's like puppy love, whatever, not like seriously dating. So there's multiple things going on here, guys. We're getting phone calls. We're getting leads to hotlines. There was a doctor that him and his wife ran a hotline, but that physician was for, to help women. That is not the same doctor as Dr. Z. I don't know. Now, in 1981, after the receipts of October 1980 phone calls, a close friend of Lorene's, Aunt Jo Beth Swanson, claimed to have seen her at a bus terminal in Boston. This sighting remains unconfirmed. Another unconfirmed sighting occurred in 1988 when a witness claimed to have seen sex worker in Anchorage, Alaska, who matched Lorene's description. We're moving forward. I think we're seeing that we've got phone calls. We've got the whole mysterious thing with the doctor and his wife and then later connecting a Dr. Z and pornographic things going on filmmaker in which I believe actually that pornographic filmmaker woman actually moved on to go to college and I think she ended up getting like her a degree or doctorate and doing like sex education or like therapy things like that so kind of a strange thing I wish I had more information on that more names more involved like I said doing this it was really hard to get a lot of names and that's hard because you can't really see like where are they now what's going on and kind of find all their backgrounds which I know had to be very frustrating for the police especially with all these little pop-ups but I keep hearing the same things with these pop-ups in the late 1980s Judith remarried and relocated down in Florida. She has stated that she believes her daughter placed the phone calls to California in October of 1980. The unnamed male friend who was drinking alcohol with Lorene the night she disappeared, he sadly committed suicide in 1985. Though law enforcement never like considered him a suspect for her disappearance, Investigators assigned Lorene's case to have stated that believe foul play is involved. That's kind of like where they summed it up at. So the friend that was with her, unfortunately, he committed suicide, but they didn't, like I said, they didn't think he had anything to do with it. They don't know what was involved or the reason why. I don't have a name to go back and look. What I want to talk about here, unfortunately, Lorraine, has never been found. They have done pictures to see what she would look like. Yeah, I think she was born in 66. She would be in her 50s now, like 54. I would think, what, 55? She's been missing for over 40 years. I will tell you this part. She stood then at five foot four. That's at 14 years old. So let's just say maybe another inch. I would say she probably, if she grew any more, would be about five, six. And some things that I want to talk about in here. So there's a couple theories I think that we can talk about really quick. I'll go back and talk about the apartment. When the mom came home and the lights were out in this apartment, the electricity wasn't out. Somebody went through the apartment and unscrewed all the light bulbs. That tells me it had to be done at nighttime. 
okay? Because during the day, people would notice that. We're talking 1980, no cameras around, so nobody's going to know who did it. With that being done, was somebody like waiting, stalking her, knowing her mom was going to be away? That could be a possibility. There's no sign of forced entry, but yet the back door was unlocked. Is there some information that the friend is not saying? But you got to remember, if there was somebody that came in and did something, the friend is there. Her, her girlfriend is there. Nothing happened to her. So I think the odds of somebody breaking in and grabbing her and taking her out, I don't think it could have happened. I do believe there's a connection with the light bulbs being unscrewed. And I don't know if it was so neighbors possibly couldn't see some. I, I don't know. I I don't know why the light bulbs are unscrewed, being that the back door was undone, was opened. They did say the front door was unlocked, which was weird. Because don't you believe, and I believe, that she would have locked the front door. So there's a couple of things. Maybe somebody came and knocked on the door. Maybe it was somebody that knew her. I don't know. But maybe somebody knew her, but he had the lights out so nobody could recognize or she couldn't recognize. I don't know. But for some reason, the front door was unlocked. I don't know. I wonder if possibly the friend heard something or wondered and went and looked out front for a minute and forgot to lock it back. And she's just kind of left that information out. The back door just takes off from what I can understand. You just go right outside from the back door. You don't really go through the hallways. So that is why it's kind of weird about the, the light bulbs. So there has to be a reason why the light bulbs were out, right? So a little hard connection there, unless she was also, she knew the person. And maybe she went out back to smoke a cigarette or something. You know, you don't, you know, we don't know. But then we get into these phone calls. I've done some research and one thing you'll know, I am very big about raising awareness for sexual trafficking, which I will tell you is why I chose this case. It is January 2023, which is Labor Sex Trafficking Awareness Month. And actually, the day that this is showing, which is January 11th, is Sex Trafficking Awareness Day. I really dug hard to find a case that I'm not claiming that this is a sex trafficking case. But I want to tell you that there are signs that could lead possibly to it. But in the meantime, some leads they were getting did follow the same type of leads that would happen with someone being abducted and brought into sex trafficking. The phone calls, the hotel, where did that come from? Why was it charged to her phone? Were this Was all this coincidence? I don't know. I don't believe in coincidences when there is a missing person and she left without money, she left without stuff. She didn't plan on leaving, which leads to me to possible abduction. Maybe she just thought she was riding somewhere. I don't know, but she left without her money, her shoes. And a lot of times in abductions, they will make sure they, if you have ID on you or anything on you, they will strip you of it. So that, that one, you are like helpless. That I mean, they, they start to strip you of everything. If you had a passport, gone. I mean, they hold on to everything. But she didn't even have it with her. So, you know, you got to remember, prior to all this happening, she was getting a little risky. She was saying she wanted to be an actress. She wanted to go out there. She was doing a little drinking. We don't know who all she might have been associating with that maybe was like, okay, you want to go out there. But do we believe she ran away on her own? No. I know that they do not believe that that was it at all. Neither does her mother. I find it kind of odd that 
there is a doctor and his wife that are doing this hotline to help people with their sexuality, to help them with identifying themselves, and that runaways tended to go by the physician's place to visit with his wife. And all this and that, you know, his story kind of changed from like, I believe, 81 to 85, like within a matter of five years. Later, with the detectives being out there, they go to this hotel. There's a Dr. Z connected to some of these things out there. Just a lot going on. A lot going on. One thing that, you know, concerns me is, you know, the charges to the house, of course, but the continuing calls, almost like if she was captured or kidnapped, were they allowing her to call enough to tease? Gotta remember, there wasn't traces and pings and cell phones and all this stuff. You don't know if possibly the plan was to start ask for money. I mean, you, you don't know if she was abducted, what the abductor's plans were, or if it was just to go into trafficking or to just simply take her life. Then the bus people say they thought they seen her, sold her a bus ticket, and then, you know, thought they dropped her off down at the park. Then later on, they don't recognize you have that. Did somebody already have her set up to get a bus ticket? They take her, you know, are they transporting her? And now these people are like backing out like, whoa, I don't, I don't, you know, they're clicking too. Like, I don't want to get involved in this. This is a dangerous business. Like I said, this is all allegedly trying to figure out what could have happened to her. Then we have the Alaska, where the sighting of her in Alaska, a sex trafficking ring. We don't know. Yes, there is a lot of coincidence kind of leading towards there. But there has nothing been proved. These are just simply theories. These are kind of my theories added with what information I've had. And others, we've all, I think, gathered a lot of the same with what we had. We don't have a lot of names. I know that there's a lot that's probably looked into this case. But you can only do so much. But I know of one thing. She has never been found, which is why I did the case. And also to bring any awareness to human sex trafficking as I can possible. Whether this case was one of those cases or not, I can at least give you the signs of it and things that they do. And the fact that they called around Christmas, they called around, called aunts, called exes. Sometimes they can do things like that to torture or to let you listen. These are just examples of things that can happen in a case like this. That's why you have to definitely wonder if that is what happened because although it's talked about a lot more now it has started many decades ago this is a very big business unfortunately it's awful it's awful so anything that we can do to talk about it please do and to raise awareness but again the mother had decided that she had to continue on she ended up moving down to Florida and living. She will always believe that she didn't run away, for one thing. And she does believe that those calls were connected to her daughter. With that, that about ends the case on the read Ron. We do not know what has happened. Like I said, we have pictures to show what possibly she could look like.
and I will see you on the next episode of The Search. Goodbye, everybody.